Two days before his crucifixion, Jesus Christ led his disciples through the streets of Jerusalem toward one of the ancient world's most magnificent buildings, the Jewish temple, reconstructed by the king, Herod the Great. Here, surrounded by walls of marble and gold, 15 stories high, the disciples spoke excitedly about the splendor of Israel's most sacred structure. Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. There can be nothing in the entire world as beautiful as this holy place. Unmoved by their enthusiasm, Christ stunned the Twelve with a chilling prophecy. Do you see these great buildings? I tell you, not one stone here shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Nearly 40 years later, the Roman army brutally suppressed a Jewish rebellion by setting fire to the temple and its surrounding walls. Stone by stone, the Romans pried apart each marble block, then threw them into the streets below. In this act of violence, Christ's prophecy was fulfilled to the smallest detail. Yet Jesus' prediction of the temple's impending destruction was only the beginning of all he was about to reveal concerning the future. Later that afternoon, he led his disciples outside Jerusalem's walls toward the summit of the Mount of Olives. There, in the gathering twilight, as Jesus looked out over the city, Peter and John approached him, fearing that if the temple was destroyed, the end of the world would soon follow. Troubled and confused, they asked, Lord, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Once again, Christ answered with the full power of prophetic truth, as he described for his disciples and every generation that would follow the extraordinary signs and events that will one day culminate in the end of human history. The teachings of Jesus on the Mount of Olives are absolutely essential to any understanding of future events and end times chronology for a couple of reasons. It's Jesus speaking, first of all, and secondly, it's in response to a specific question and set of questions such as, what are the signs of your return and of the end of the age? And it's the only time that Jesus really took the time to lay out a chronology, detail by detail and sequence by sequence, for us to understand. He knows the end from the beginning. He's God, and on him the Spirit, the Bible says, rested without measure. Now, the Holy Spirit rested on all the prophets, but I think we can depend on the words of Jesus in a special category. And what he did is he gave us an outline on which all other prophecy must rest. Christ's description of the end times is now recorded in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In each of these accounts, Jesus foretells the incredible scenario that will unfold during the final chapters of the Earth's history. 
Listen to my words. There will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. Christ's prophetic teachings read like a horror story of natural disasters, spiritual deception, famine, war, and death, the likes of which the world has never known. For nearly 2,000 years, these words have sparked both fear and fascination as 50 generations have anticipated their fulfillment. Today, many believe we are living in the final generation. Yet there is no way to be certain, for an aura of mystery still surrounds the catastrophic events that, according to Jesus, will one day shake the foundations of this planet. But as we walk in the lengthening shadows of the end times, we can be confident of two things. Christ's prophecies are, at this moment, closer to fulfillment than ever before. And they are resonating with the daily course of human existence throughout the world in a harmony that cannot be ignored. Let us look now to the future, as seen through the eyes of Jesus and the prophets he inspired. For in their words, we will discover important clues to understanding all that is to come. Prophecy itself is God's way of reminding us that He alone knows the future, and therefore He alone can tell the future. The signs in prophecy are indications to remind us that if you see these things begin to happen, then know that the rest of the fulfillment is close behind. If we are indeed living on the verge of prophetic fulfillment, then it would seem our need for insight beyond mere human speculation has never been greater. 2,000 years ago, Christ began his discourse on the future by identifying for us specific signs that he said would herald the beginning of the end of time. Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. In uh, Matthew 24, Jesus warned, in answering the disciples' question, he warned about 11 times, beware of false teachers and false Christ and false messiahs. As we have moved into the last 150 years, false prophets, false cults, false religions have just exploded. Uh, there are numerous cult groups today that are growing into the millions of followers. Spiritual deception has always played a significant role in the human drama, for in every generation, many have come as messengers of light, only to lead their devoted followers into spiritual darkness. In recent years, some of these false Christs have become household names. Jim Jones and the Tragedy of Guyana, Marshall Applewhite and his Heaven's Gate suicide cult. David Koresh and the disciples of the Branch Davidian. Each of them claimed to be the Christ, 
the chosen Messiah, and each led his flock astray with promises of deeper insight and enlightenment. Christ prophesied that in the final days, these masters of deception will increase in number and influence as a desperate world searches for spiritual direction. And as these counterfeit saviors flourish, their tools of persuasion will include more than convincing rhetoric. And they're going to increase and increase, and I would be so bold as to say on the basis of Matthew 24, they will increase in power. They'll have power to perform miracles. They'll have power to, he to perform healings. They will try to replicate the miracles of Jesus and prove themselves to be false messiahs, giving false teaching. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Christ also warned that the end times would be marked by a dramatic increase in warfare. There is little doubt that the 20th century has given us a vivid glimpse of what a world dominated by military conflict will be like. For the last 100 years, scarcely a day has passed when the planet has not been scarred by warfare. Two world wars, punctuated by countless ethnic and regional conflicts, have claimed millions of lives while shrouding the Earth in tension and fear. Since 1945, nuclear weapons have given man the power of self-annihilation. The fuse on what is perhaps the most deadly threat of all seems to grow shorter by the day. The prospect of all-out war in the Middle East. Whether or not our generation is living through the specific wars and rumors of wars Christ foresaw is open to speculation. But amidst the anxiety and bloodshed, there is little doubt that modern weapons of destruction, coupled with ever-mounting political tensions, represent the volatile formula that could potentially lead to the end of civilization as we know it. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilences in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Like the specter of escalating warfare, Jesus said that a progression of devastating natural disasters will also underscore the approach of the last days. Again, our world is well acquainted with these fears. World Relief Agencies estimate that as many as one-third of the Earth's six billion people are victims of starvation. 34,000 of them die of famine-related causes each day. Of the 68 most devastating earthquakes in recorded history, 46 of them occurred in the 20th century. In sub-Saharan Africa, 23 million children are infected with the HIV virus, 
the deadly killer for which there is no known cure. When Jesus talked about things that were going to occur in the future, and he referred to them as signs that were coming, he also refers to them as birth pains. They'll come on you like birth pains on a woman. Uh, those begin to come intensely, but they, they start to intensify and come more rapidly, more quickly, as you get to the time when the baby's delivered. I think it's obvious then that he uses the term birth pains to symbolize the fact that some of these signs of the future may begin to come to pass on the scene slowly, one at a time, but eventually more and more of them will come in rapid sequence. Christ's warnings bear an obvious resemblance to another prophetic image revealed by God late in the first century. On the island of Patmos in the Mediterranean Sea, the Apostle John beheld a series of visions. In one of them, four mounted horses appeared on the horizon of the future as the ominous messengers of the final apocalypse. The first horse in John's vision was white, and it symbolized the rampant spiritual deception that would grip the earth in its final days. A red horse and rider followed, the images of intense warfare throughout the planet. Then a black horse thundered through the earth, wrecking havoc with famine and natural disasters. And finally, the pale horse of death made its dreaded and inevitable journey. Spiritual deception, wars, starvation, earthquakes, at intensities beyond anything humanity has ever experienced. They are early signs of the end times, prophesied by Jesus Christ. There is an ancient Hebrew proverb that proclaims, Israel is the center of the earth. In the context of the end times and the signs that will foreshadow their coming, there is little doubt that this small strip of land at the crossroads of Europe, Asia, and Africa is the focal point of all that Christ and the prophets taught about the future. You have to put Israel and Jerusalem in every factor about end time prophecies because it's the center of the earth. And in this end time uh, event, you'll find that God still has many plans and promises for the Jews that are going to be fulfilled. Certain geographic locations are made important by God because God's veracity and uh, truthfulness hinges around him doing certain things at certain geographic locations. So we're seeing that history does not move forward prophetically unless the nation of Israel is involved. Israel's spiritual significance was established nearly 4,000 years ago when God set apart the Jews as his chosen people and promised them this land as their home. Today, Jews from around the world gather in Jerusalem at the Western Wall, the last remnant of their ancient temple. There they pray and remember the words of God's enduring covenant. Israel will bud and blossom, 
and fill all the world with fruit. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up from David a king who shall reign and prosper. I will grant salvation to Zion and my splendor to Israel. You will be my people, and I will be your God. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them. There is an unbreakable bond between God, Israel, and the prophetic events of the future. For here, in this land, the final confrontation between good and evil will be waged. Here, on the Megiddo Plains, the full measure of God's wrath and judgment will descend upon the planet. Here, upon the Mount of Olives, Christ will return in all of his glory. And here in Jerusalem, Jesus will establish the throne of his kingdom that will last for a thousand years. A kingdom of perfect peace on earth and the prelude to the eternity of heaven. According to biblical prophecy, each of these events will take place only when Israel is a Jewish nation. Yet throughout most of history, the probability of such an occurrence seemed virtually impossible. For by the end of the second century AD, foreign invaders had driven the Jews out of their homeland to the far corners of the earth. The tragedy of the dispersal of the Jews was a tragedy of unspeakable and seemingly unending dimensions. I don't think anyone understands what it's like to be become a no people. It isn't that they were a nation without a country. They weren't a nation anymore. How can you be a nation without any communication, be, be scattered this far? And not only that, but almost everywhere that they've been scattered, I believe supernaturally through the occult influence of the dark side, the Jewish people have been persecuted. There is no way to capture the desperation of a Jew outside of his land. Um, who is, is facing that kind of situation for n close to two millennia. Between 135 AD and the beginning of the 20th century, control of Israel would pass through the hands of the Romans and the Arabs, the Turks and the British Empire. This tragic dispersal of the Jews not only destroyed their nation, it also suspended the progression of biblical prophecies relating to the end times. Then, in 1917, the winds of change began to blow. World War I and the issue of the Balfour Declaration paved the way for Jews throughout the world to return to the land that God had promised them. And for two decades, a small stream of immigrants entered Israel. This flicker of optimism proved short-lived, however, as the outbreak of World War II and the horrors of the Holocaust claimed more than six million Jewish lives. But when the war ended, unimaginable tragedy again turned to hope as the floodgates of history's greatest human migration miraculously opened. On May 14, 1948, after nine months of debate, the United Nations voted to recognize the new state of Israel. Billions of Jews from every continent joyously poured back into their ancestral homeland. Their ravaged country was rebuilt, and against all odds, Israel existed as a Jewish nation. Many considered this the greatest fulfillment of biblical prophecy since the birth of Christ. Out of all the nations of the world, 
the Jews started gathering back and there were very few in 1917. Today there are over five million. It's an incredible migration in fulfillment of prophecy. In June of 1967, the momentum of prophetic fulfillment accelerated again when the Jews took back control of Jerusalem in the Six-Day War. After two millennia, the promised land and its capital were restored to Jewish sovereignty. When they occupied Jerusalem, that was a stellar day, and it, I think it ignited the clock of God's prophetic calendar and it's moving relentlessly to the fulfillment of all these things. Either the stage is being set or the signs have already begun to be fulfilled. Israel's back in the land. There's conflict between the Jews and the Arabs. The Western powers are trying to broker peace treaties in the Middle East. Weapons of mass destruction already exist. So all the things the Bible says are going to transpire at the time of the end are already beginning to transpire. That ought to get our attention. These are like red lights flashing at me saying, wake up, we're getting awfully close to the final fulfillment of all of these things. Israel's restoration is the catalyst that will ignite the fulfillment of all that Christ and the prophets foretold about the future. Yet since Jesus spoke to his disciples two days before his death, the meaning of his words have been debated by theologians and scholars of every generation. In the process, several interpretations of what the scriptures actually reveal about the planet's last days have emerged. Let us now turn our attention to one of the most widespread and compelling of these interpretations. It is a scenario of the end times based upon centuries of biblical scholarship and analysis, with specific focus on the personalities and events millions believe will shape history's turbulent finale. As a new millennium dawns on Israel and the rest of the world, this explanation appears more feasible than ever before. And when considered in the light of prophetic understanding, it is not difficult to imagine how someday the events you're about to see could actually unfold. Though the biblical signs of the end times are numerous and well-defined, the specific event that many believe will trigger history's final countdown will come without a hint of warning. It is an event that will catch the entire world by complete surprise and then plunge it into total chaos. To those who have studied the prophetic calendar, it is known simply as the rapture. The rapture of the church is easily the most exciting event that could ever be imagined in the minds of men. Um, God has given us this report that it's going to happen in a twinkling of an eye. You have to be prepared in advance. You can't get prepared when it happens. The most detailed biblical accounts of the rapture are found in the New Testament. Not all of us will die but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout and with the trumpet call of God. First, all the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and remain with him forever. For all of its mystery, 
Perhaps the most compelling aspect of the rapture is its imminence. It could literally occur at any moment. And as the scriptures tell us, there will be no doubt when that moment arrives. The entire planet will be shaken by a thunderous shout and a piercing trumpet blast. Then in cemeteries around the world, graves will split open and Christians who have died will rise from the ground, not as decaying flesh and bone, but as living human beings with transformed bodies ready to meet Christ in the air. An instant later, millions of people from every walk of life will vanish as they too will encounter their Lord between heaven and earth. Regardless of age or nationality, every man, woman, and child who is taken has one thing in common. Each of them believe that Jesus Christ is the savior of the human race. In the hours immediately following the rapture, a panic-stricken world will attempt to come to grips with the unexplainable. Governments will frantically search for answers, and the news media will race to cover the story of the century. But in these attempts to find the truth, the world will be blinded to the most obvious explanation, that which is written in the scriptures. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, they will believe the lie. Uh, some official statement will be made. Aliens got them, laser beams zapped them, something that sounds reasonable and credible, and the majority of people will believe that explanation rather than believe the truth of Scripture. Chaos will be rampant in the months that follow as fear and confusion engulf a planet trying to cope with the disappearance of an enormous segment of its population. And as anxiety builds, the birth pains of spiritual deception, wars and natural disasters will accelerate while the earth stands on the brink of a terrifying future. I think in Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about the time of tribulation and judgment that is coming in the future. The tribulation period is an expression of the wrath of God against an unbelieving world that occurs, I'm convinced, after the rapture of the church. Well, the tribulation period must be put into perspective. Uh, it is real. It is a time frame of seven years. The Bible says God cut it short because it's such a traumatic time. It's worse than any time that has ever been or ever would be. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. There are more scriptural references to the tribulation than to any other historical period mentioned in the Bible. In the Old Testament, this seven years of turmoil is also called the day of God's vengeance, the time of Jacob's trouble, and the time of the end, while New Testament descriptions include the hour of judgment, the great day of his wrath, and the end of this world. In every case, the tribulation is prophesied to be a time of literal hell on earth when God will exact his final judgment upon a world that has rejected his love. The tribulation period is separated into two halves, three and a half years that are just plain tribulation. It will be very trying. 
Then the next three and a half years, Jesus called the Great Tribulation. That will be three and a half years that are worse than anything that he said ever would be or ever was. So consequently, it will be the greatest time of trauma in the world, and man will suddenly be aware of the fact that there is a supernatural God. The scriptures indicate that though the focal point of the tribulation will be the nation of Israel, the full magnitude of its impact will be global. No one on earth will escape the catastrophes spurred by the events and personalities described by Jesus and the prophets. We have a scenario of what that period's going to be like. And so we can sit here and build a model of the players who are going to be involved, what part of the world they're going to come from, and we can see that God is setting that stage in the last 50 years like he hasn't done in the last 2,000 years. Tribulation may well begin with Israel facing an age-old crisis. She is threatened on all sides by her Arab neighbors. With the prospect of war growing by the day, the always tenuous security of the country will appear more vulnerable than ever before. As tension in the Middle East reaches fever pitch, a charismatic world leader will arise out of Europe, offering the Jews the one thing they most desperately seek. They're harassed by the Arabs, they're harassed by the enemies, the anti-Semites from all over the world, and here comes a world leader that wants to give them the guarantee of peace. He's going to come on the world scene and be the leader, and he's going to amalgamate the world and bring all of these countries together in the name of world peace. The Bible refers to this leader by many names. Master of intrigue, worthless shepherd, the beast, the Antichrist. In what appears to be an extraordinary act of diplomacy, the Antichrist aligns himself with Israel and brokers a peace agreement with the Arab nations preventing an all-out war. And when he makes a league or a covenant with the children of Israel, a peace covenant for seven years, it's not for 10 years, 15 years, it's seven years. And when he makes that covenant, that starts the tribulation period. Yet immediately after the peace accord is signed, any thought of tribulation is obscured by the Antichrist's soaring popularity. Empowered by Satan, he becomes the head of a European confederacy of nations that will rule the world in its final days. Many scholars believe this confederation will stand as the most powerful economic, political, and military force in history. To a planet weary of turmoil and war, the Antichrist is hailed as a savior. To the Jews, the treaty he has forged represents the key to the fulfillment of a dream, the reconstruction of their temple. Once the Antichrist comes on the scene, the Bible clearly indicates that he'll sign a peace treaty with the nation of Israel. Some believe that that peace treaty will allow them to rebuild their temple and that he will guarantee them security and survival in the Middle East. Today, the reality of the temple's reconstruction seems impossible, for standing on the traditional site where the Jews must rebuild is one of the holiest shrines in the Muslim world, the Dome of the Rock. This sacred mosque, completed late in the 7th century, 
rises from the spot where Islamic believers contend their prophet, Muhammad, ascended into heaven. It is revered by nearly a billion Muslims who would fight to the death to defend it. Any attempt to move the dome would now be considered an act of war. Yet, miraculously, during the early stages of the tribulation, perhaps through the negotiations of the Antichrist, the dome is removed from Jerusalem and construction of a new temple begins. Jews today in Israel say they could rebuild a temple in seven to 11 months. In other words, they've got everything ready to go. And there are whole organizations over there that exist that do nothing full time other than to study how we're going to rebuild the temple. If the announcement hit the newspapers tomorrow that permissions were, were in place and the money was there and construction was about to begin, there would be tears of joy and dancing in the streets of every orthodox and conservative Jewish home and community on the planet. As the world watches in amazement, the temple is rebuilt and the sacred rites of worship are initiated once again. For Jews throughout the world, the joy of this sight is overwhelming. Yet the newfound sense of security they feel is only an illusion, for the Antichrist is about to reveal his true nature. Midway through the tribulation, he suddenly breaks his treaty with Israel and unleashes a torrent of persecution against God's chosen people. The whole purpose of the Antichrist at this time is he's shifting from protecting Israel during the first three and a half years to persecuting Israel. We can only assume, perhaps out of jealousy, perhaps because he senses that uh, they are now the focus of the attention of the world, the rebuilding of the temple, uh, and uh, the reinstitution of the worship of God. But I think the ultimate issue is because the Bible says that Satan fills his heart. And if he is empowered and indwelt by Satan himself, Satan hates the Jewish people because they're the covenant people of God. And you always see Satan behind the scenes saying, if I can destroy the work of God, whether it's in the human race in general or the nation of Israel in particular, then I can keep God from accomplishing his ultimate will and purpose and I will eventually vindicate myself. The horror of the second half of the tribulation will eclipse the worst hours of the first three and a half years. In the interest of global security, martial law is being immediately... Dropping any pretense of his earlier role as a peacemaker, the Antichrist moves by force to strengthen his hold on the planet. His agenda expands beyond military, economic, and political objectives when he moves to establish himself as a god and demands the worship of the entire world. His closest advisor, the false prophet, creates a universal religion, positioning the Antichrist as the supreme lord. As an act of allegiance and identification, every person on earth is ordered to wear the mark of the beast, 666. Without it, no one can buy or sell in the global economy. Then, at the height of his arrogance, the Antichrist commits the ultimate act of desecration against the Jews. He enters their holy temple and erects an idol of himself as an object of worship.
Some suggest that the temple is so beautiful and so wonderful uh, that he cannot resist wanting to go to that temple, sit in the temple of God, defile that temple by his presence and claim, I really am God incarnate in human flesh. Let the world know that I am God. And from this day forth, in what will appear to be a miracle, the idol of the Antichrist will speak, commanding the world to bow down in worship. Satan will actually give it power. I, I don't know if it'll be electronically capable of speech or if it'll be supernatural. And people will hear the voice of this beast, this idol, and be tricked into to worshiping it. And when they do, they will have forsaken their soul. In the Gospel of Luke, Christ issues a startling warning to anyone who refuses to follow the Antichrist. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out. And let those in the country not enter the city. For Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. There is an obvious sense of urgency in Christ's words, and all who heed them will find their route of escape leading to the vast wilderness areas south of Jerusalem. There, the Jews will hide from the wrath and persecution of the Antichrist. The Old Testament talks about them being hidden away in Basra, which is a Hebrew for sheepfold, and that is believed to be the uh, ancient city of Petra, which is in Jordan. It is not hard to envision how the ancient city of Petra, 100 miles south of Jerusalem, could provide sanctuary for thousands of men, women, and children during the last days of the Great Tribulation. Carved from solid rock, by an Arab merchant population more than 2,000 years ago, Petra is an almost impregnable fortress. The abandoned city is surrounded on all sides by towering cliffs and accessible only through a chasm that narrows to a width of 12 feet. Here, many believe God will supernaturally protect and sustain his people perhaps by providing water from a rock and manna from heaven, as he once did for Moses and the children of Israel. While those in the wilderness are protected by God, the rest of the world is embroiled in total chaos. For the death toll from the birth pains of war natural disasters and famine rises to more than a million human lives a day. By the middle of the tribulation, 50% of the people will have been wiped off the face of the earth. So sociologically, that would send everything into chaos. Half the police officers, half the school teachers, half the, the medics and doctors and the professional workers. Uh, everything that the Antichrist tries to do, he's going to have to be searching for uh, capable people because so many people will be wiped out. It's going to be a time of chaos. As his control of the world erodes, the Antichrist's anger against the Jews intensifies. And at the height of his fury, he orders his armies of the European Confederacy to converge upon Israel. Committed to the total annihilation of the Jewish race, the most powerful military force in history assembles here on the Megiddo Plains, north of Jerusalem. It's the Valley of Jezreel, the breadbasket of modern Israel, a valley some 50 miles wide and 200 miles long. It's the largest flat area in Israel. It's the ideal place to assemble an army. So it becomes in the Bible a term, a symbol of major war and conflict. Many of the battles of the Old Testament era were fought on that location. While the forces of the Antichrist invade Israel, 
Another army, 200 million strong, marches relentlessly from the east toward the plains of Megiddo. The stage is now set for the ultimate confrontation between Satan and God. Antichrist begins his campaign to destroy the Jews by attacking Jerusalem. The fighting is intense, and the Jews are defeated, suffering enormous casualties. With Israel's capital under his control, the Antichrist then directs his attack on the Jews who had fled the city after the temple's desecration. He orders his armies into the wilderness. As the Antichrist approaches, the Jews will cry out to God for deliverance and turn to the Messiah they had long rejected. In that extraordinary moment, God's covenant with Israel is made complete, and the prophetic words of Christ again come into focus. O oh, Jerusalem, I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For the last remnant of the Jewish population, terror now turns to hope as Jesus Christ, their promised Messiah, stands ready to return and fight the legions of Satan in the final battle of Armageddon. And so the final confrontation taking place at Armageddon, just outside the city of Jerusalem, uh, indicates to us that in God's view of things, Jerusalem is the center of the world. This is the place where the line of the Messiah started. This is the place where Jesus died on the cross. This is the place where it's all going to culminate in this final battle. And then when Christ returns, he'll go to Jerusalem, sit on the throne of David, and rule the kingdom just as the Old Testament prophets predicted the Messiah would do. The very prospect of Christ's return shakes the universe to its core. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. And the heavenly bodies will be shaken. The heavens are darkened like a great stage before the curtain rises on the most dramatic event in history. Then what Christ described as the sign of the Son of Man will appear for the entire world to see. A brilliant light that radiates to every corner of the planet. It is called the Shekinah glory of God. As Jesus appears, the Antichrist and his armies are filled with rage. Now, under the complete control of Satan, millions of soldiers, armed with the weapons of mass destruction, launch a lethal attack on the king of all creation.
And when he comes, it says, the tribes of the earth will mourn. They're not rejoicing to see him, and they do not repent, and instead shake their fist in the face of God and say, in essence, we will not submit, and we will not bow down to you. And when the scripture describes this battle, it simply says that he returns and speaks the word. And it's over with. The God who spoke the world into existence in the person of his son can speak a final word and the army of the Antichrist is defeated. Jesus does not come back with planes and guns and bombs to win the battle of Armageddon. He comes back with the power of the word of God and speaks the word. I don't know what that word is. Perhaps peace, be still, and it's over with. He who could still the storms and cast out demons and conquer the hearts of individuals will ultimately prevail and conquer all at the Battle of Armageddon. The return and triumph of Jesus Christ will ultimately transform the devastation of the end times into a remarkable new beginning. For in the aftermath of the judgment at Armageddon, control of the earth will pass from the dominion of Satan into the hands of God. In the decades that will follow the final apocalypse, the planet will be renewed as instruments of peace replace the weapons of war. And for a thousand years, Jesus will rule the universe from Jerusalem, his holy city. Then to all who have believed in Christ throughout the centuries of human existence, God will open the gates to his eternal kingdom of heaven. There, the pain and suffering of the great tribulation will be washed away by a river of healing and hope. The darkness of spiritual deception will yield to the radiant light of perfect truth. and the sting of death will be swallowed up forever by the joy of everlasting life. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life.